Hi everyone. Um, I know it's been a while since I've done a video. There's been a whole lot going on. Um, an unexpected death of someone extremely close to me took me out of town for a while. Um, and things have just kind of been hectic since we've gotten back. Um, one of the things was that I ended up with sepsis yet again. Um, I got really sick, uh, high fever, cold chills, body pain, um, pretty much everything except for delusional is how bad it got for me. Um, I went up to I think 103.6 this time um, versus the 105 something that I went back in May I'm being told. Um, it's the same strain so their concern was that it was my port so I no longer have my port. It was surgically removed and the pocket that they placed the port in showed no signs of inflammation, no signs of infection. They cultured the catheter of the port thinking maybe that's where the infection was and um, it wasn't that. You know, my port was completely okay. Um, it was just an infection that had gotten into my bloodstream. So of course when they're drawing blood off of my port, it's going to show that because where else is it going to get the blood from? But unfortunately, all of that did, was not figured out until after they surgically removed my port. So I am stuck with this for at least a month. It's a dual lumen um, pick. It's inserted in the arm right here. Actually, the insertion site's right here. These little wings are tight, are sutured in, or stitched in, so that the pick won't move too much. And then it actually runs in through the deep um, vein directly into my heart. Same way that the port kind of worked, just um, different access points. And this doesn't come off. If this comes off, the entire thing comes off. Um, and I cannot wait for the day for that to come. So right now, with the Dumbo Lumen, because I'm doing antibiotics three times a day, and then I'm also on my TPN, and I also have meds, we're actually using both the red and the purple one. Um, typically, one is, typically if I wasn't doing antibiotics, the red would be for blood work, the purple would be for TPN and meds and fluids. So, um, but I have a little bit of a system going. And with a pick, you kind of just can't walk around with it, like, waving in the air like this. It's going to get pulled, and it's going to hurt. And, yes, that's still bruising from over a week ago now. And it was a whole lot worse. I was bruised all here. It just looked like complete blood. That's it. Um, so usually what they do is they give you, like, a little stocking. Some people have started using... Um, socks that they don't wear or socks that they like and feel will be more comfortable for them. They cut off the foot and it works just as fine. What I found to help me is I've cut a little notch in the pick or in the stocking and pulled my pick through. That way I can wrap my lines completely. And I fold it over. And it's a good thing I can rotate my shoulder more than most people can. And there you go. Now my pick is protected. I can't get it caught on anything. There's a little bulge here where the ends are, but that's fine for me. Um, and that's really been working. So, just FYI for future reference, if anybody is having issues trying to find a way to cover their picks. And this also allows me to still be able to use my pick without, um, without worrying that the other lumen is going to fall off. So, with the way picks work, they insert it, and this right here is the end point of the pick, where they would usually place 
one of your caps on for you to use. First of all, I'm right-handed and it's on my right arm. So that's impossible for me to do. I mean, I'm flexible, but still not that flexible. <laughs> and then on, secondly, it's not, you know, it's just a little too short. So this right here, that's twisted onto the end of the, uh, the lumen all the way to the cap is an extension. So that extension is what I use to hook up. It gives me a little bit of extra room to move around also because it's not very much room um, when it's hooked up here. It's not very much room at all, especially if you're hooked up to medications or TPN. Um, and I haven't had my pick long. I've had it for, what, seven, eight, eight or nine days now? And so it's still a process for me. So if, I, if I'm not using a lumen at the time, I do keep it wrapped and out of the way just to make sure that I won't snag it on anything. So this grenade is actually my antibiotics. The way these work is pretty much they're filled to their max in like a rubber balloon and cap very quickly. The line coming from it is made to specifically allow only a certain amount of whatever's in the grenade to come out over time. So I think like this one will only allow 100 milliliters per hour. And so this is actually a half hour infusion. It's really nifty. I don't have to sit there and count minutes and, you know, push with the syringe. An IV or a syringe push is faster, but I don't need to hook this up to anything. I don't need to hang it from anything. All I have to do is hook it up to myself and I can let it sit on the floor or bed or wherever I am at the time, in my lap, in my purse, and nobody knows wiser. So <clears throat> I've got the pick line out that I want to use and that needs to be flushed. And port care and pick care are very similar um, in regards to you want to make sure you flush well always you know have for nice again just because I got this because I had an infection doesn't mean that the pick itself can't give me an infection either so you want to watch out for infections any signs of infections um, the other thing about picks that's more common than anything I've had to worry about with my ports is you can end up with a blood clot and that blood clot could cause pain and swelling in your arm um, pretty much anything that, if you've had a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis, like when they're concerned that you have one in your calf, if it's red and swollen and warm and painful, you know, you'll know. So, and those are a couple of things to look out for. You still can't get the line wet. Um, it's a lot easier to waterproof a pick line though than it is to waterproof any chest central line. Just because of the chest central line, you're constantly moving and your skin is, you know, lifting in some areas and not in others. And it's like trying to tape a kid <laughs> down onto his seat. It's not going to work. So, yeah, you know, most of us have made modifications to make showering easier, even though it sounds more complicated. Um, but that's how most of us do it. Um, okay. So I scrubbed my my hub clean, and now I'm gonna flush it with saline. <clears throat> and while I was gone, I thought of like five or six different video ideas that I wanted to do and didn't happen. <laughs> I can't remember half of them. I'm sure they'll come back to me soon. But um, 
All right, so then I scrub my hub again. I take off the cap for the antibiotics. I connect it. And literally, all I have to do is make sure the line on my pick is open. And then open the line on this. And now the medication is flowing. Um, <clears throat> I do want to talk about sepsis. If you have an infection that you know about, you need to get it treated properly and and as fast as possible. Um, when the infection goes into your bloodstream, it can become extremely dangerous, which is why some of the signs of sepsis are extremely high fevers. Um, it affects your mental capacity. Some people are delusional. Some people are just unable to comprehend a, sen a, a very, like, third grade sentence, um, you know, and it can start spreading into other parts of your body. So when I was admitted, they were running all kinds of tests, um, since I think that this may have been the same infection that I had back in May, kind of lying, not dormant, but in hiding, I should say. Um, so they had to run MRIs on my spine and brain to make sure that you know, there's no signs that the infections have spread into my bones, which would have been osteomyelitis, which is an extremely, extremely hard situation to deal with. Once you have an infected bone, um, things will get crazy. Um, osteomyelitis can lead to amputations and things like that. Um, Working for the neurosurgeon that I did, I think I remember one case where he had to remo completely remove the vertebrae and put in, um, put in a fake one until it would um, fuse together so that that missing vertebrae was no longer an issue. Um, they checked, they did a head CT um, to make sure that the fluid in my brain was okay I was scheduled for a lumbar puncture um, but after my MRI and after talking to the residents <clears throat> um, this is about two days before I left we all decided that um, if it was in fact some type of meningitis um, I would have been in a lot more pain um, than I was because when I had meningitis back in February I was in hell um, all the lights in the room needed to be turned off, no TV, no talking, even just someone opening the door could make me cry. Um, <clears throat> also, um, they did a whole lot of blood work, um, and they checked um, ultrasounds. They did ultrasounds of my liver, my spleen, my kidneys, my uterus. Um, ovaries, you know, just to make sure that, and they did an echocardiogram to make sure that the infection hadn't spread into other parts of my body and was just maintaining in its blood. The scary thing about sepsis, though, is you can be asymptomatic for a while, and by the time you start getting those high fevers, those cold chills, those body aches, you know, that feeling that, hey, something really isn't right here. It could be too late. It could have spread all over and it could be causing multiple issues. Um, and the thing is, it takes time to figure out which strain of bacteria it is that's running through your blood and figure out. And then on top of that, once they figure out the strain, they have to figure out its resistance to a whole bunch of antibiotics. And I'm just lucky, for me, I was lucky because. I had gone to the ER while I was in Texas, and they had admitted me, and they had already started all that blood work. Um, so by by the time I was at that point where something's wrong, you know, we we need to go in. Um, we had some additional information. Of course, they're gonna double check it themselves, um, but it was a little bit more helpful because they were able to put me rather than on. A broad spectrum antibiotic, you know, four or five broad spectrum antibiotic. They had me on three that focused more on what my labs were showing that I had. And then 
after I got my pick, we slowly cut down um, to just the one. And then I got sent home on Cephazolin for the next two weeks. And I don't know if you guys can tell, but it's starting to get smaller. But, um, <clears throat> and then I see infectious disease, and hopefully, I am praying to every single God, angel, Buddha, whoever listens, <laughs> that I can go back to getting either my port or do Lumen Hickman. I'm not sure which yet. I have to speak with my GI doctor as I'm ready to start a new course of treatment for my mast cell condition and that course of treatment is a anti-rejection medication that is going to kill my immune system so we are looking for the best option to avoid um, infections knock on wood I've been very lucky it's been two and a half years since I've had a central line two and a half years since I've had a port. Um, and this infection in May originated from my stoma after my feeding tube was pulled out. And this time around, it still wasn't my port. So I'm yet to have a central line <clears throat> infection, a legitimate one. But the concern will grow because I already do have a compromised immune system and we've tried building my immune system up and that didn't work for my mast cells. And I'm drinking a bottle to a bottle and a half of Benadryl daily and on top of that I'm on Zantac, Zyrtec, Singular, Zyflo, um, Doxapen, Atarax and it's like a five six hundred pound man football player or whatever would be knocked out for a month with as much medication as there is in my system and as much antihistamines as there is in my system and it's doing nothing for me. I'm still scratching myself till I bleed. I'm still getting hives. Um, just last night, I ended up back in the ER because I had uh, I had two anaphylactic reactions requiring me to use my EpiPens. And typically, I don't go in for every time I use my EpiPen, even though I know I probably should. But if my vitals are really good and it clears up really fast, then you know our hospitals two minutes away it doesn't take long to get there so <clears throat> um what's it called so we usually wait and then about two hours later i had a rebound reaction that was a lot worse and it required the second epipen and the second epipen is kind of crossing the line and so i had to go into the er but i shouldn't be having reactions like that with as much medication as i'm on and it's very frustrating so I want to try this new medication the concern is that I use my port or Hickman or pick whatever I use my central line not just for my TPN and not just for blood work I get IV medications um, I'm hoping to restart IV fluids because in the hospital my heart rate was down to 88 and I haven't seen my heart rate that low in almost two years <laughs> so it's time it's time to do something about that again I uh, sitting comfortably at 120 is um, not healthy so <clears throat> I have an appointment with my doctor on the 29th I'm definitely going to be discussing a lot of this with him um, I need to discuss better nausea control with him <clears throat> I'm hoping to try and get him to give me some IV Finnegan again because IV Finnegan really does help control my nausea which allows me to intake more fluids orally and so maybe could cut down how many days a week I'm infusing you know I'm doing hydration therapy um, or something um, otherwise I've been thinking about it a lot and I'm thinking of asking for my feeding tube back um, not to run two feet, but 
to have the ability to vent my stomach so that I'm not in, in as much pain as I am daily and also the ability to push my medications into the J tube because realistically they work a lot better and a lot faster that way um, and I think that's one of the reasons why things have kind of escalated since my feeding tube was pulled the absorption of my medications is not proper um, and doctors are always looking at me like you know well, you have Benadryl at home why do you need it here and they just don't understand yes oral Benadryl works but it works to an extent and how long does it take to work is the question IV Benadryl works immediately or IV Zofran. They asked me why I get both IV and oral Zofran at home. And I said, yes, the disintegrating tablets work very fast and they do help. But once I start throwing up or once I get past a certain point, oral Zofran doesn't do anything for me anymore. And I have to switch over to the IV. And I've been using up my IV Zofran like there's no tomorrow. Um, anyways, I got sidetracked. So. Um, in case you guys couldn't tell, that little rubber ball on the inside is really starting to shrink. It's about that big. And really all it's going to become is it's just going to become like a, like a column right here. And it, like a hard column know, from, that would connect like these two points on the inside. It's pretty cool. I don't have to worry about timing I don't have to worry about you know if it's finished if it's pumping air I don't have to worry about priming a line um, all I have to do is just hook up and then once I'm done with the antibiotics I will flush with normal saline yet again, obviously with alcohol swaps, and flush with a heparin to hep block my um, line to make sure that no blood clots form. And last but not least, my company sends these. They're called Curos, and they go on the end of the cap like this. They just twist on. And what it is, so you take the the peel, you peel the top off, and that's what it looks like. And then you hook it to the cap like this, and obviously twist it on. But this is all that it is. Oops. It's that's the inside without it. It's a piece of foam soaked in alcohol, so that when you scrub it when you screw it on it kind of scrubs it and cleans off the tip of your catheter and then it keeps it clean so say you're out with friends um, you know you don't have to be too concerned about where your line is landing if it's not if you don't have it up for whatever reason now I know some people who walk around without a cover on their pick um, personally me, I am a klutz and that's not going to happen. Um, I will get it caught on something and I will pull it out, which will hurt since it's stitched in. Uh, the first night I had my pick, um, my nurse, no, the second night I had my pick, um, the nurse got tangled in all my lines between the TPN and the antibiotics which had to be piggyback and the Phenergan which had to be piggyback and then the fluids that they had me on which was like 40% dextrose and um, I I wasn't paying attention to what she was doing she got up to walk away and took my lines with her and holy crap did that hurt I wanted to slap her I really wanted to slap her. Like, it was just like, 
everything was still fresh. You know, still hurting from my incision, still hurting from the placement. Um, on top of that, since I had to have anesthesia with my MRI, long story short, they maxed out, last time my port was changed, they maxed out on the amount of verse that they're allowed to give a patient and the amount of fentanyl that they're allowed to give a patient. I was completely aware of what was going on. I could feel everything. And lidocaine, um, in a lot of people with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, burns out of the body very quickly. So I was in a lot of pain and uncomfortable, and it triggered a reaction, so they had to give me Benadryl. I had a nurse standing by me with um, an intubation kit and they were all just waiting for me to just stop breathing <laughs> so the PA was like that's it anything we do with the central line anything we do here you have to have anesthesia um, my port removal pick placement um, was supposed to be scheduled the day of my birthday and the MRI had been scheduled for the next day um, but the there were some scheduling complications, and so they scheduled it for that or move my port removal to the next day also. And so they gave me the their best thing is since I can't lie still for a very long time, um, I needed the anesthesia for the MRI also. And so they decided to just do it all at once. I would go in, get my port removed, get my pick placed. They would transfer me over to MRI. My MRI would be done. I'd be brought out and I'd be good to go. And um, you know, they were all very prepared. They had me intubated. They told me that they were going to bring me out of my um, anesthesia as slowly as possible to avoid triggering a reaction. As far as I know, I didn't get a dose as I was coming out, a dose of Benadryl, but I really didn't ask. And, um, but my entire body felt like I had been, like, mobbed. Like, one of those people <laughs> that gets crushed on Black Friday deals, you know, waiting at the door. And, um, so I was extremely sore, not in a good mood. And then the nurse tripped over my line, and all I wanted to do was grab the closest thing and just throw it at her. I know it was a mistake, but... She had already been giving me an attitude um, about my medications, and I just was not feeling good. I, I'm i the first person to sit there and appreciate nurses and all that they do. I wanted to go into nursing myself. My best friend is a nurse. My best friend's mom is a nurse. It's just my mom works in the medical field. You know, I understand shit happens. I understand that you might have a bad day. Um, you know, I understand accidents happen but whoops is not the response you give when you have just almost ripped out a patient's pick line <laughs> so I just at that point I turned to the TV and I just ignored it but um so that's kind of been my week since I've gotten back from El Paso still trying to get a lot of stuff figured out um any questions let me know I have ideas for videos I just I haven't I didn't write them down so they're in here somewhere and I'm trying to get them to the front of the line might take a little while um, oh <clears throat> vials of love um, when I was admitted I ended up with a roommate who was pretty cool we talked um, exchanged contact information um, and she actually was in the room on my birthday, and I had two Spoonie sisters come and visit. And the four of us were all talking. Um, and I've been wanting to do something through Vials of Love that really does give back more than just donating money. And so um, I was talking about doing bags, like gift bags. We talked about doing the children's hospital, but my roommate said her daughter was just at Mott's, um, which is the children's hospital portion, and they have so much for them, you know, to keep them entertained, to keep them, you know, preoccupied, things like that, and 
Um, U of M is amazing. They are constantly walking around. They have coloring books and crayons. Take as many as you want. It, you don't have to be the patient. Here, take five. You know, you have a daughter in surgery. Here, take another one. Um, they do, like, bracelet making kits and, like, little paper folding kits. And, you know, again, take as many as you want. All you have to do is ask. Um, they do offer pet therapy, I think, once or twice a week. Um, they do... They have volunteers who will go and sit with the elderly for a little while. Um, they have a massage program. It does cost money, but um, when you're in the hospital, uh, sometimes a massage doesn't sound so bad. But I wanted to do something that would make it a little bit more personable. And I want to do it for around the holidays. I want to do gift bags um, <clears throat> filled with just stuff. Um, I've talked to Tori and through Vials of Love we're going to do some stuff. Um, I have a few people who are volunteering to help with all of this, you know, include items from their um, businesses or even just a personal craft project that they are doing. Um, any businesses, either you can email me your information and I'll print out a list of, you know, I guess don donors like business donors or I can include gift cards or sorry business cards into the gift bags um, and I think I think really that's it if you I know times are tough financially um, if you cannot donate items donate ideas things that you would like someone to give you um, like I said, coloring books, crayons, that type of stuff is kind of covered. Um, someone was saying headphones, um, things like that. Um, so hopefully, you know, don't be afraid. Email me. Comment here. Um, I really do want to get this started. I have to contact the nurse um, person so that I can get dates of when we would be able to oh, it's done of when I would be able to deliver stuff like that and um, then go from there but like I said if you can't donate it's understandable try donating ideas try donating by spreading the word you know you know somebody who works for a big corporation that likes to do stuff like this let them know um, the holidays, I've spent my birthday this year, and then a couple years ago I spent Thanksgiving in the hospital, and it's hard. I don't want to be there. No patient wants to be there on a holiday. And for if I were to spend Christmas, I don't know, I don't know what I'd do. Christmas is my favorite time of the year, and to be admitted, yes, well, I know it will probably worth, you know, be saving my life. It would just tear me apart. So my idea is just to try to, you know, remind people that there's still hope out there and, um, you know, people that care and people that understand and, you know, once you're out of the hospital, things you can, you can enjoy, a late Christmas, a late Thanksgiving meal, um, but, you know, you're still alive and that's one of the biggest things that matters. Um, to, and then to finish this. This is how it looks now. All of this right here is used to be filled with the fluid. So I've disconnected. <clears throat> I'm going to flush. This is the heparin. Now 
And these are called Kuros. So it's just a little like piece of tin foil on top. And that gets it open. And then all you're going to do is just twist it onto the cap. And you're all set. So it took me about four days to figure out a way to protect and wrap up these pick lines that worked for me. And like I said, the cutting of the hole was the best idea that I had, and it's worked the best so far. So I'm sticking with that. Just an FYI, you don't have to do it the same way as me. Um, you could just do a longer piece of stocking and just have it all underneath the stocking. Some people have it like that. Um, other people will fold it like I have, but it's underneath it, not like in between in layers. It's however feels comfortable for you because you're the one that's dealing with it. Um, but like I said, um, life with a pick for at least the next month and a half. Hopefully, hopefully less. But um, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, and as usual, any video topics you'd like me to cover, um, send me a message, comment, and we'll get there. Have a great day.